Hey there, welcome to the show. Thanks for listening. I have a quick announcement before we get started. If you subscribe, you'll never miss a single show. And it's really easy to do this and it helps me a lot. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show and click subscribe. Thank you, I really mean it. Now here's the show. This isn't your average business podcast and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today's show is brought to you by FreshBooks, an extremely fast and user-friendly cloud accounting software made by a small business owner for small businesses, entrepreneurs, and anyone who wants to get paid fast. Join over 5 million FreshBooks users who effortlessly create and send invoices in seconds. Just go to freshbooks.com slash James and enter James in the How Did You Hear About Us section. A special thanks goes out to our sponsor, Wonder Capital, an online investment platform that allows individuals to invest in solar projects across the United States. Learn how you can begin earning up to 11% returns at wondercapital.com slash James. That's W-U-N-D-E-R Capital. Wonder Capital, do well and do good. Today on the James Altucher Show. It's a very difficult um uh, spiral that I that I enter when I start um, when I start you, judging myself. On the days you get out of it, how do you get yourself out of it, or do you never get? Out, have you never gotten out of it? <laughs> We're turning this into a pharmacology report. Um, it's okay. Um, Many people listening to this yeah. need, need a pharmacology report. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you must like just bathe in it when you tell jokes. And everyone's <laughs> laughing. Yes. Oh my God! I can't believe. My favorite comedian is standing right in front of me. You are my favorite comedian. Well, you and Louis C.K. are my favorite comedians. Really? So Gary it's... Goldman, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me on, James. I, re I really appreciate it. I, I saw the list of people you, you've had on, and I'm just uh, I'm honored. No, but this is the interview I'm most intimidated by, so oh, God. Just, just bear with me. All right. So first off, let's just get this out of the way. You just had a, a special release on Netflix. It's about time. I've watched it twice. It's incredible. Anybody should listen to it. I hope every single person listens to it. You have such a unique style of kind of creating, I don't even want to call them jokes. Like, is that a weird word, joke? Like, I feel like no. joke is like the same as like shtick. You know? <laughs> no. Like, you tell no. stories that are like unbelievably funny. Oh, thank you. Uh, shtick is, is, yeah, that's, that's, um, a ne negative connotation. Like I think of knock knock jokes when I right, think of a right. right joke. But but jokes, I, I like that. I don't mind that at all. I need new jokes. I'll say that frequently. I need new jokes, or I'm working on a new joke, or I'd I'd hate to go to the next level where you're calling it a, a piece. I have this piece on, yeah. You know, so that's <laughs> that's obnoxious. So I, I I prefer jokes to to just about any other description. Do any comedians say piece? Uh no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, not that I hang around at my level. No. So so okay. That's an interesting phrase you just used. My level. What does that mean? Um, I think I'm I'm uh, on the outside looking in at at uh, some some really great uh, performers and 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 you know I, I have it's it's interesting. I wonder if it gets more difficult when you get acquaintances or friends who really really make it big. Does it does it um, make you feel feel um, left out or or something like that? And I'd say yes, it does. But yes, like, who's who's an acquaintance that made it really big? Well. You may mention Louis C.K., who I've opened for in the in the past, and I, I just think of all right, he's he's sort of the 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 gold standard, and then everybody else is kind of watching him. Um, I mean, not everybody, but there are f there are a few people really at his level, and I, I don't I, I consider myself way off that pace. Why do you you know again? I I, I, I put you and Louis C.K. in the same. Wow. I just put you in the category. Maybe I'll throw or start to throw Amy Schumer in there because she's like breaking out so huge and she's she's obviously very talented. So talented, yeah. And uh, why do you feel like? I mean, you've done Netflix specials. You've done all sorts of specials. You you you've been on all sorts of shows. Uh, you you perform, do four hundred sets a year. Why do you <laughs> feel like just because he has this TV show? And you don't. It doesn't sound like you've really aimed yourself in that direction. Why do you feel like you're on the outside looking in, in terms of the the art of what you do? Well, I I guess I aimed my my myself at at being a, an excellent stand up, and then th hoping that other other things would fall into place. But really, I've just become um, an excellent. My my goal was to become an excellent stand up. I, I feel I've, I've I'm in the I'm in the ballpark of excellent stand ups. But um, you know, the other ancillary things that that 
frequently come to come to excellent comedians didn't really didn't really pan out for me and so i i feel like i, I um i feel left out i guess i guess that's the best way to put it but but also the the most um immature way to put it well let's let's reel back and and you know you've done some excellent podcasts with with other people brian cobbleman uh mark Marin, a, bu a bunch you've you're, you've been on a bunch of podcasts so people could sure. hear about your background in many places but i do want to actually touch upon your background because it's interesting so so obviously you've been doing this for a long time when did it start you're from boston which is where louis ck is from yeah. so maybe you knew each other back in back in the day there but but where did you start and, and why why did you do comedy um, By the way, you're six foot six. Yeah, you probably could have been a basketball player. <laughs> no, so, but you chose I, comedy instead. If I could have been a basketball player, I think I would have been a basketball player. But I, um, I started my first open mic was October eighth, nineteen ninety three. So I started at an open mic in, in Boston at a place called Nick's Comedy Stop, and I had to had to bring three friends, and then they put me on for five minutes, and it went it went well. What uh, was some? What was like one joke? Um, one piece. I did. I, back, <laughs> back then, I did. I did impressions. So I did impression of um, Seinfeld and Kramer playing playing basketball, and that was like a that was a that was like a big I got a big response. So I was very very encouraged by it. And then within a year, I I decided that my impressions were not very good, and that I needed to speak in my own voice. And that's that's when I sort of got on the on the track I'm I'm on now, which is which is um, you know straight stand up, observational type stand up. And do you feel you were early in the observational thing, or whatever, was everybody started? Because around like the mid '90s, I feel uh, there was this like almost. I don't want to say renaissance, it seems like the wrong word, but it seems like observational humor got started getting really big, both in all the different comedy festivals I was going to and, and everybody I was impressed with then. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I grew up on, really. When I, when I was a kid, I, my mom would let me stay up to watch the Johnny Carson show, and, and my favorites were... were um, uh, Gary Shandling and da especially David Brenner. I really, I really loved it. David Brenner when he would come on the Tonight Show or Merv Griffin or or uh, the Mike Douglas Show. So I got really into that type of observational humor. I found I found it easy to repeat to friends and and family and get laughs off it, which was, which was a bit a big part of me me um, starting off just uh, stealing these jokes from from television programs that I had saw as a little kid and and doing them for my family and friends. So this is almost like the first level of practice that you did so yeah. it's almost like 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 take uh playing the piano as an example it's not like people sit down at the piano and make up their own songs the first thing right. they play songs and learn yeah. the, the the craft of it I, I hate to use that word i know that's a, a funny <laughs> word for you i heard on brian's podcast oh yeah, yeah, but yeah, they, yeah. they learn the craft of yeah. it from playing other people's songs until it's really great and they get they see they get the feedback by seeing the response of people like oh you play well so is that how you first kind of started developing the the skill yeah i would i would say so i, I would say that's where i where i uh, at least built up a love for it and an understanding of how the jokes worked and and um although it didn't make it any easier for me to write my own stuff when it came time to when i was in my in my 20s but i did i did uh, probably pick up on some of the timing and and uh delivery of, of of a lot of those comedians so 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 writing timing and delivery i want to get back to those three things yeah. but so again so so you were you were obviously made your friends laugh you, you go through high school you go through college what's what's happening what t turns you into a stand-up comedian you did, you did this open mic um but why did you decide this is going to be it for me i i love this more than anything else yeah i, th I think probably if i if i hadn't if I had um, taken to uh, public accounting and auditing and, and really found it easy and rewarding, then maybe I wouldn't have had the need to do stand-up comedy. But I, I really found that job to be uh, boring and unfulfilling, and I couldn't really rationalize it in the in the world like I was doing something for that that had sort of an ethical quality to it. So I I, I found that stand-up comedy gave me gave me a lot of rewards as far as making people feel a little bit better and and uh, forgetting about their problems for for a short time. So, but it's not just that, right? Like if they laugh at your joke, you feel a little better. Oh yeah, yeah. So totally. there's a kind of approval yeah. need as well there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Some it, kind of high can, that you were getting. Yeah, it, it's it's an addiction. It's it, it definitely is. I mean. 
I, I don't need to do 400 shows a year to to keep up my my chops but it, it feels like I, I need that that shot of adrenaline every every night I, I mean my I have a, a, a major depression that that um, sort of uh, fluctuates during the day and it gets a little bit better at night and and I think part of it is because I'm around people and I also get this this um, this boost in in serotonin and dopamine by by doing um, by doing shows for the for these uh, people at night Hey, and you have a joke, actually. Uh, I can't remember the exact specifics, but you talk about serotonin and dopamine. Oh, like yeah. you're you're an expert in these like neurochemicals. Yeah. yeah, you can you can get little shots of serotonin and dopamine by having those those small conversations with. with oh yeah, neighbors. Trader Joe's. Or, or, yeah, the Trader Joe's. And, and Trader Joe's also the people who who interact with you at Trader Joe's are, are so friendly that you can get a you can get a um a quick fix of of dopamine or, or and or serotonin by by uh, through the exchanges at Trader Joe's. Yeah. And you must like just bathe in it when you tell a joke and everyone's <laughs> laughing. Yes. So, uh, yes. So, so, okay, so back in the 90s, you start getting better and better. When do you realize, okay, um, I'm surpassing the people around me. I'm actually developing a really good skill at this. Um, I would say probably by the end of 1998, I, I figured out what I was doing as far as... Um, as far as taking a step forward in that in that world, which at the time was the 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 um, course was usually you would do, you would do stand up for five or six years and then you would get management and agents and and either audition for things or a big thing back then was to get was to get development deals to make to make sitcoms. So I I, I got a few of those and that 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 changed my life. That was uh, enabled me to move out of my my mom's house and and move to California and start um, start doing comedy full time. And what happened then? Like, what development deals did you get? What is a development deal? A development deal. They they give you money to not sign with another uh, station, um, uh, network, or or production production house, and um, and then you write a pilot, usually with a with a with another writer. They give you what's called a showrunner, who's an executive producer and has some experience running sitcoms and pilots and so they they put you with them and and i wrote a pilot with this with this man and it didn't it didn't get picked up which means it didn't get shot as a as a pilot what so was it about it was about a guy who lived at home and was um trying to start his start his life and and um lived in the same hometown that he grew up in and had the same friends and it was it was biographical or autobiographical and um it uh it it was very um it was nice. It was nothing spectacular, and and um, I remember the Fox Network passed on it, and and the next year I had a similar situation at CBS, and then I had one at um, Showtime, and and later NBC. So I, I was, um, yeah, I was I was popular in that in that circle as far as getting um, deals to develop develop sitcoms that that didn't really pan out, which was very very disappointing. So 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 by that point you're somewhere between like 27 30 31 yeah, yeah. what what um this is kind of like a normal period where people have their first what what they would label as a failure like everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. every before that you kind of like you you don't bl you blame failures on everyone else or blame oh you're young and you need to learn but at 30 you sort of start to feel like oh my gosh I need to already be at the next stage sure. so what were you like let's say CBS rejected you. This is the third one or the second yeah. one. Like what? Uh, what's going through your head? Well, uh, up until time, that time, everything I had really put my my whole heart and and energies into, I'd succeeded at, and from from being a good student, being a good athlete, and then and then being a good stand up, and and they just said yes, yes, yes all along, and then this this was my first big no. So it was it was it was jarring, um, and it was. Uh, there was a lot of self-esteem on the line, and I had I had really believed in the in the projects, and really believed that they would put me to that next level where I would, where I guess I would know what I was uh, know what I was doing, and I was making a living, and and not worrying about um, you know whether I would make it, and and felt that being on TV was was making it. So I had to, um, and I was also living in Los Angeles, so I didn't have that outlet a lot where I could get on stage frequently and and work out my my jokes so it was um it was a it was there was a lot of boredom and a lot of um a lot of uh yeah lonely nights and and uh there, there weren't there was just wasn't a lot to do in los angeles at that time unless you were unless you were working so i but i stayed there from from 2000 to 2006. 
Wow, because 2006 is when you moved here, and I feel yeah. like things, that's like when your biography sort of starts on Wikipedia, like suddenly you start doing like all these specials and this and that. Yeah. Like the things start to take off as stand up here. Yeah. But, but was that painful to make the decision, okay, I'm going to give up on LA and go to New York? Um, it was, it wasn't so much, uh, painful because I, I was, I was doing it, I was just going to do it for six months, but I, I fell in love or became addicted to the stage time you can get in, in New York city. Whereas a, a good week out in LA, I could get on four or five times. And that, that was a really strong week for, for performance. And, and here, um, I can get on, uh, 10 times easily and, and without, without really, um, uh, hustling that that much. So just, again, it's that it's like again, it's not that um, it's so great to make ten groups of people feel good. It's like you needed that. Oh yeah, stimulation. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and a lot of times it it but it it is just uh, being out with people and interacting with people, even if it's on stage. But but also off stage, I'm talking to the other comedians or the people who work at the club. So I'm getting I'm getting a um, not not the recommended daily uh, allowance of, of of social interaction, but but some social interaction compared to what I'm I'm used to at, at home all day, which is where I which was where I um, I hide out and and ruminate and and um, beat myself up. <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine about uh, the martial arts teacher. Uh, I think his name is Frank Roberts, and he says everybody needs a plus minus uh, equal. Meaning, you need uh, a com in your case, you would need a comedian better than you that you could learn from, someone who's equal to you that you're both sort of challenging each other, and someone less than you that you can either teach or you could say, "Oh yeah, I'm clearly better than this guy." <laughs> so, do you feel like you, you that was kind of in New York with so many comedians around, a kind of a whole culture here of, of stand up comedy? Do you feel you were able to find your sub? culture here where um, you can learn from yeah i definitely i definitely get in, inspired by a lot of the a lot of the men and women who who perform in um in in new york and um most of whom i feel are are in that plus category and then um i have a, a lot of a lot of equals who i can who i can relate to and 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 sort of commiserate with about the the um the injustices that, that we that we face in the, in the business and and although although I've you know had, had a I've received pretty just treatment there there are still things that that um, alienate me and make me feel feel left out of the like what the, um I don't know there there are just uh, certain certain shows or, or movies that come on the air and you see a lot of your friends be on it and then you're like well, well I I can't help but take it personally I take it personally every every time like they just People must not like me or not think I'm I'm talented, so I feel I feel um, left out a lot, and it, and it's not a it's not it's a similar feeling to um, you know just being a, a kid and not being invited to the the, the cool person's birthday or or make the 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 best team or th things like that. It's 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 just um, I I haven't uh, grown out of that. But but okay, so you've been doing this for twenty years. You've you've definitely tried the development deal world. Now you've been doing. 400 uh, sets a year, but you just had this Netflix special out, which must be some sort of validation. Like it's an it's an incredible special, and now there's more outlets than ever with Netflix, Netflix, Amazon, Comedy Central, yeah. HBO, all these places you could put, produce specials. Like, and you just had a special come out. Don't you feel that's some sort of like, oh yeah, I'm getting this recognition? Well, a little bit. It, it's nice that the people really like the the special, but I also feel like. Well, they're gonna come see me on the on the road, and I need to have material that's either as good or or nearly as good. And also, I need to have uh, different material because the the new the new paradigm that that guys like Louis C create Louis C, Louis C K has has created is that you turn over your material more frequently. Now he does it every year. I can't imagine that I can do that, but I'm I need to I need to get close to that because I I feel like I'm I'm. I'm I'm always nervous that I'll lose fans if they if they come out and see me and they're like, oh, he did the same, the same jokes last time. So it's it's um, and and I'm you know in a period of of I wouldn't call it writer's block because I, I have been able to put out some things and I have been been creating, but it's it's not flowing like it like it did for this for the material that I did on this special. This special came together within. Within a year and a half, I would I would say, and and it's taken me longer to to um, to build up replacements for the for the jokes in that special. But let me ask you this: like, so I I write a lot and I do a lot of articles and blog posts and books and so on, and I always feel that like as soon as something's finished and people like it, it almost makes me feel bad because oh, yeah. now I have to come up with something better or equal or, yeah. or something, or else 
that's it. You're only as good as your last yep. thing. So but have you been feeling this for 20 years, this exact thought? Uh, totally. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so you recognize that you, that this is something you always feel. So now do you use it to kind of motivate you or do you use it to sort of justify depression? Um, yeah, it justifies depression and, and paralyzes me. And, and, uh, one of my, my best, it, it, it motivates me, but when I'm in the, you know, the, my, my current state, it, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, it makes me more resistant and, and just, um, beat myself up more for not being more, more prolific. So obviously people tell you, everything I've just been saying and yet it's not it's and you go on and you get the approval of an audience um why don't you think that's enough to say okay now I can sit down and focus I'm gonna whatever it takes I'm just gonna um focus on working on my next material I feel really good about what's happened before like why is it so difficult why does it kind of slip across that edge into depression is, do you think it's more chemical do you think it's more circumstance um I think it's more I think it's more chemical because of my um I, I have actual actual symptoms of d depression. Not not really a down day, but my mind is working slower. I'm moving. I'm moving slower. I almost feel like I'm moving in in slow motion. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not able to um, to uh, get enough sleep. There doesn't seem to be an amount of amount of sleep that's that satisfies me. And and so I, I think it's more. Um, it's an actual actual depression that I think arose from, from finishing my last, my last special, which I, I actually, the, the special that just aired was recorded last, last year in 2015. So, um, it, it took a while for it to come out and I, and I, and I, um, as much as people tell me they, they really like it, I, um, I could, I could pick it apart all day long and find, and find the flaws in it. So it doesn't, it, I'm, I'm just there's there's part of me that's just waiting for somebody to say the exact um the exact thing that i that i fear is 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 the case with the with the special so every once in a while i'll get a negative a negative comment and i'll be like see they they um they don't like it it's not that it's not that good it's, so it's, there it's is crazy. A, a ratio like that i think it's the 10 to 1 ratio where for every one negative comment you get you have to get at least 10 positive comments to make you feel as oh good. yeah yeah, and yeah it's yeah, like totally. an evolutionary thing because if uh, if if there's an apple tree and a lion, the lion is t a thousand times as bad as the apple tree is good. Right, right, so right. you were conditioned to respond to negativity much, much more, much more emotionally. Yeah, oh, that's that's interesting. That it's instinctual. That's that's interesting. So so like, uh, what what's when you look at the last special? And I just I loved it so much. But like, what what's and obviously many p listeners haven't listened to it yet. But what's like a bit you could criticize that? I, I would understand because I've seen it. Well, the, the, see, I, I think that the audience and I are not on the same, um, not on the same page. Like I, 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 I wonder whether they didn't react as big because I wasn't committing or they just didn't react as big because they, um, maybe the, the, uh, ceilings were too high. So I couldn't tell how they were reacting. So I, I, I know that, that I've had better, um, sets and I've recorded better sets and I just I just feel like the audience wasn't um uh a hundred percent with me. Were they were they zero percent with me? No. Were they were they over eighty percent with me? Uh probably. But I was I was looking for um the perfect set uh because I was recording it and I had waited so long to re record it for a for a special so that when it when it wasn't perfect I I was um I was devastated, which is not the, it's not proportional to what, what happened. I wasn't, I wasn't, yeah, people are laughing. Throughout. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't booed off the stage and I didn't have, uh, any kind of breakdown, but I, um, I watched and I'm like, oh, I, I wish that, that, that joke had gotten a better reaction. I wish the audience had been more on board for that one. And, and so, um, and then there's a, there's a joke that, that I wound up leaving out, which was about, um, role playing with my, with my girlfriend. And, and I, oh my God, you did yeah. that on, I think Conan. Uh, Conan yeah. Yeah. And that was the, I've played that for a thousand people. Like that is oh, the wow. funniest oh, thank bit you. ever. Why did you leave that bit out? Um, it's hilarious. It was, uh, just, just, you gotta just do it right now. You're, you're, <laughs> don't do the whole bit, but like, just what, whatever you want to do, do, do of that right now. Well, I, I, I just talk about, um, it, it, it actually stems from, um, just, uh, being the worst role player, but I, I really consider myself this great, um, uh, role player in that I, um, I commit to the, to the situation. So my, my girlfriend is a, I'm a professor at a prestigious New England university and my girlfriend is a senior in my intro to Western Civ. And then people, people laugh at that. And I say, well, um, 
I don't know why she was in the, a senior in the intro either. Um, she she gave me some BS about transferring in from Syracuse or some safety school. But anyhow, it goes it goes on for about seven minutes, and the and the main thing is that um, I'm so into the role I'm playing as professor that I really forget about the the sex and become more concerned that she'd become a a better student and a, and apply herself and stop wasting her her parents' money. <laughs> It was great, and I love also how you you almost, and I don't know how you, I want to discuss how you kind of build into a bit like that, but you start off with like a mini bit with, uh, first you say she's the, you role play, she's the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. and you're the Deputy Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, yeah, yeah. but you feel like she's not pushing her agenda enough. Right. So that kind of gets this intro laugh, like you kind of soften up the audience to the idea, yeah. and then you go into the kind of professor-student thing, and it goes so far beyond the typical kind of professor-student cliche of role play, like you, right. get, you commit so much to it, it's ridiculous. And you tell this whole story, and then there's tangents, like the whole thing about the school doesn't like Jews, so you can't get yeah. ten years yet. Right. <laughs> so it's this whole thing; it's crazy. And uh, uh, how do you take a bit like that? Like, how do you sit down and start crafting that? Like, what was the initial thought? Like, oh, this might be funny, and then how do you keep pushing it? Like, why do you know to keep pushing it, and where? Um. I guess you know the feedback from the audience. You get there's there's a certain instinctual thing that I that I get where I'm like, well, there's room to put more uh, more of a joke in there. There's room for more more lines, and then it just becomes um, what the what the audience will allow. How far you can you can go, and and the main. But sometimes going far is in itself funny. Like yeah. the audience thinks you're finished, and you just keep going, and yeah. that by itself is funny. Yeah. Yeah, they they will they will laugh at that sometimes going going far off the off the um, beaten path. But I um I, I guess the the theme of that joke became uh, be as specific as possible as far as as far as what you could want as a as a professor and and then on the other side what she wants as as a person trying to be a lover and and just um, the 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 difference between my my expectations and her expectations I guess is where the where the joke how much how much of that I was thinking when I when I wrote it probably probably none but I but I felt it that there was an there was an instinct there that the more specific and the more I expected of her as a as a student then the then the funnier it would it would get because of the the um, it's just uh, it's just absurd that that I would go this far in in um, in uh, she she's willing to do anything to pass and she thinks she's just gonna have sex with me but I I, I keep insisting she do um, extra credit and and, <laughs> and I, I try to work with her by saying how how well she participates in in class and, and things like that and it's the specificity that I think is almost like a hallmark of a lot of your jokes like you you start off going down one direction and then any time another topic almost comes up you go really far down that tangent and then you pull back masterfully you know and you, you sort of pause and then like you're, you're like right back into the, the thing you were doing before like when you were doing the trader joe bit there, uh -huh. there on the last special there's so many tangents you go into this is like a 14 15 minute yeah. joke and you go down into the whole Golden Girls thing, and Phyllis, <laughs> and you know, Department of Commerce band that name in 1933, and it's going on and on, and then, uh, and then the woman who rams into you and her whole her whole thing, but you and you t you describe it with such seriousness. It's like not like you're telling a joke. It's like you're. It's almost like you're dumbing yourself down a little bit, telling this incredibly serious story about something not so serious, and that's part of the humor. And again, I'm trying to figure out, like, what's your, what's your thought process as you're constructing these, these elaborate jokes? Uh... Maybe I'm dissecting it too much, even. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, I know that one, one thing I was in, inspired by over the over the past several years was a was a documentary that that um, that they did about Bruce Springsteen writing and 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 recording "Born to Run," and I just remember him going over every single note from every instrument in in making that album and and the record "Born to Run," and and I was just like, well, all I have are these these jokes, which is a bunch of sentences. I don't have to figure out where the saxophone comes in or where the rhythm guitar should come in so I, I can really go over every word in this joke to see whether there's a, a jumping off point um, mm -hmm. where I can where I can digress a little bit and and to me those are, are like um, I was always a big fan of, of Rube Goldberg machines um, you know like like mousetrap and I and I just feel like um, if the if the mouse is a laugh 
and all these different areas I go to along the way to get that laugh are are interesting and un, unusual, like they are in that in that game Mousetrap or in a good Rube Goldberg um, drawing or, or cartoon. Then I'm like, then the audience will will stay on for the ride, even though I could have gotten to the catching the mouse much much quicker with a with a one one or two liner, and and so that's um, I, I think maybe that's the best way to describe it is that is that the um, is that the 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 digressions and everything become sort of um, uh, a, d a delivery system for the for the for the laugh. Try to try to get the the laugh, but in a, in a way that hasn't been hasn't been done before. It's so hard to be original at the, at this point. I, I don't consider myself especially original in in content, but I, I feel like maybe I arrange the wording and the laughs in a, in a different in a in a unique manner. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Money has never made me happy, but it has made me feel secure. And that's really important. Security and freedom, especially if you're an entrepreneur or freelancer and you're never sure when you're next going to get paid. I have a question for all of you entrepreneurs running your own small businesses. If you started this minute, how much time would it take you to figure out which clients owe you what? If it sounds overwhelming to you, then you need to give FreshBooks a try. FreshBooks is dead simple, cloud accounting software made for entrepreneurs and small business owners who want to take the work out of managing their paperwork. Join over 5 million FreshBooks users who effortlessly create and send invoices in seconds. No formulas, no formatting, no fuss. Plus, FreshBooks has the best customer service. Your call will be answered within just a few rings, guaranteed. The best part about using FreshBooks is that you don't have to worry about your paycheck because FreshBooks is a reliable service that makes invoicing easy. Right now, FreshBooks is offering a free 30-day trial to my listeners. Just go to freshbooks.com slash James and enter James in the How Did You Hear About Us section. I really don't get dressed up for anything. Even when I had an office job, I was the worst dressed person in the office. I think I even got a trophy for that, or maybe that was just in my imagination. The most I'll do is wear a lab coat. I don't wear suits, I don't wear ties, because traditional menswear doesn't make it easy. I can't even tie a tie. It's also, all that clothing is too stiff and restrictive. The discomfort is a distraction at a time when you need to be able to focus. Ministry of Supply has set out to fix this problem. This means clothes like dress shirts and slacks that wick sweat, breathe, and stretch with your movements. Their Apollo dress shirt has NASA invented fibers that regulate body temperature based on your surroundings. It's better than a lab coat, and I bet it's more comfortable than what you wear to work. Visit ministryofsupply.com slash James and get 15% off your first purchase using code JAMES15. Or visit one of their stores in Boston, San Francisco, and coming soon, Washington, D.C. And by the way, if anybody from Ministry of Supply is even listening to this podcast, Please open up a store in New York as well. But for now, I'll buy your clothes online. In 2010, I wrote an article not about global warming, but about global cooling. And then my friend Tim Sykes interviewed me about it. He asked me why I'm analyzing how to profit from chaos and a future apocalypse. I don't even remember my answer, to be honest. And my answer now would be different because my life changes pretty much every six months. Your life could change too. One way my life changes, I'm always trying new things. Look at technology, it's constantly accelerating. Every year, computers are getting faster and faster, cars are starting to get automated, solar panels are getting more efficient, everything is changing. And when it does, it creates huge opportunity. Imagine if you could do something like help global climate change and make double digit returns at the same time. Now you can. Introducing Wonder Capital, that's W-N-D-E-R, the Techstars-backed online investment platform that allows individuals to invest in solar projects across the United States. Your investment with Wonder goes directly to helping healthy U.S. businesses install solar panels. As those panels repay their loans to Wonder, you receive steady monthly cash flows in the form of interest payments. Since the beginning of the year, Wonder has originated over $25 million worth of solar projects. Wonder has two funds available. The Wonder Income Fund, which returns 6% a year during a 10-year period, and the Wonder Bridge Fund, which returns 11% a year during a 2-year period. And best of all, Wonder doesn't take any fees for investing your money. Learn how you can begin earning up to 11% returns at wondercapital.com slash James. Wonder Capital, do well and do good. 
what is originality in content? Like, take Louis C.K. for instance, okay? People have been complaining about their kids and babies forever. Yeah. Uh, take any ethnic uh, background. Everybody complains about their ethnic background. Uh, you don't do it so much. You're Jewish, and you, you definitely have, like, a set of Jewish jokes. But, like, you know, it's not a big part of your act, I feel. And, uh, again, so, like, like with this... Uh, role play joke, and again, I, I people could go Google your or YouTube your um, your clip from Conan where yeah. it's just like perfect. And you start off again. You could have ended with the, 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 or you could have pushed the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development thing, but you switched right into yeah. another thing, which is the student teacher thing, and then that kept going into tenure and, like you say, extra credit and uh, you know why you know why is she a senior but in your intro to western civ class like just all these ridiculous things and it's interesting i didn't think of it that way it's sort of like you took each word and almost looked at it how bruce springsteen's looking at these notes and figuring out what else to do with it and it's an interesting way to to do it it's almost i'll say another example it reminds me of did you ever read read the godfather by mario oh Puzo? yeah 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 i loved it he yeah. he in uh, and he does that in the book and they don't do it in the movie but like he'll go off for like 90 pages oh, on yeah. that woman's like you know vaginal tightening yes surgery. yes 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 so, and that's and never in the movie obviously it's, it's it's in the movie um sort of referred to in in the fact that she's she's very attractive to sonny who it's clear in the movie has a has a, a big member because his wife gives the gives the um uh indication with her hands how big it how big it is um so that's the only sort of um uh evidence that that this that this woman is 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 different but but yeah that that's that's a long a long and drawn out digression in in the godfather and it really makes yeah it. like like a 90 page digression yeah, and yeah. he never did that in his prior two books which weren't successes like that oh, was, that's his first book was a success and he went on all these digressions yeah. and so it's interesting the digression thing i never you know because again most comedians they kind of tell their story they tell their joke and then they go on to the next and you give yourself i think a lot of power by pushing and pushing on the one idea and again that structure in and of itself is funny and and it requires timing so let, let's go into the timing thing because you'll go down this whole way which which will lead to you know you're angry you're telling a joke there's laughter coming and then there's almost like a pause you have like your finger up and then you're back to the the old the original joke right. so like what, what what is timing what's the difference between a, a good comedian with timing and a, a not so good comedian with timing I Maybe mean, that's a broad question. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I know that I do use timing. I don't. I, I think it's more, um, and I don't think it's instinctual. I think it's something that I've improved with uh, over the years, and just being in front of, uh, getting all the repetitions, and, and being in front of hundreds of audiences a year. Um, but uh, I'll still make some mistake with with timing. But it's just it, timing is a matter of when you say the when you say the punchline, or when you when you. Um, when you take a, a step off the off the, um, the the main story and and digress and and so there there um, yeah there are a lot of timing issues but I I don't feel like that's something that I that I concentrate on or 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 have to make um, conscious. Probably, you feel like it's like real subtle changes as you see audience after audience react to you then you yeah. kind of almost make these uh, yeah so it's, it's interesting I watched um, this is almost like a before and after I watched uh, Anthony Jeselnik do some stand up. When he was still a writer for, um, I forgot what show, maybe Fallon. Or... I think Fallon, yeah. Yeah, so he was doing some stand up then, and that now he does his own specials. Yeah. And you see, the one main difference is timing. Like he's oh, much wow. quieter between, he'll pause a lot more, almost uncomfortably. And you have your own uncomfortable pauses almost. And, and it seems like that's a big key in this, is being confident enough in your material to pause. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's true, and I think that the pauses come under the under the uh, banner of of timing. But um, yeah, and it, it does require confidence because you're afraid you'll lose the lose the audience. But in in some cases, it's it's just a matter of um, giving them a second to to catch up or just um, make make the uh, in, inject some 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 um, not drama, but um, they're waiting to uh, some some tension to build up some some tension with the with the jokes. And then the the other thing I think that's kind of part of your style, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is what I was, what I was slightly mentioning before. You almost slightly dumb yourself down to create this artificial importance about like 
a trivial story, like let's say uh, a woman cutting in line at, at Trader Joe's. Uh, but then the joke itself is funny because you're talking about this, uh, you know, story and you're using like intense vocabulary. And, <laughs> you know, I forgot which joke, maybe it was the same one. You start talking about the difference between temerity and some other word. And, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you're, yeah. You're like Audacity really, versus temerity. Yeah, yeah, like you're really kind of intellectualizing like this this uh simple confrontation and that, that's a really and that's you did that in the role play joke as well and you, you did that in a lot of the jokes uh and you know what how did, did that consciously come into play in your writing style or has that always been there or no i I, th I think it's something that i that i um that i probably um was was aware of as a as a, f a funny thing um just to just to talk about small things with the, with a with a more um uh, intense vocabulary so um but that that was something that i that i sort of locked onto early in my early in my career i think if you if you saw early early versions of my of my um comedy you you would say oh he sort of does the same the same thing but for a shorter amount of time back then and and um and it's the uh yeah, the 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 getting cut in line at, at Trader Joe's though. That's a, that's um, you know it's not a hundred percent true, but there there was that I was I was enraged by the by the um, by the injustice of it of it all. And did she did she say really say you'll get over it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really yelled, "This isn't fair!" And she really turned around to me and said, "You'll get over it." And 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 I that's was painful. Uh, yeah, it was really really painful. Imagine um, if a girlfriend said that to you. <laughs> I what, know. What would you do? I know. I would be I would be devastated. I would be outraged, which I which I was. I was outraged, and she wasn't even a girlfriend. She was just a, a, a mean a mean woman at the at the Trader Joe's. And you know, I, I think I think it would destroy me actually if someone said that in a Trader Joe's to me. Like I would feel. But you kept pushing. Like you, yeah. You did you really make like? Did you really try to get back um, in front of her? I, I did. I did. Uh, I did. I did try to uh, outmaneuver her. And and um, you know, there's a point where where it it probably wasn't more than um, thirty seconds where she got called to the next. She got called to the next um, cashier, and I got called to the next cashier. So it, it really didn't didn't make a big timing. It just it just was the the uh, injustice of it all that she could that she could leave her cart in, in front of me and go get more things, and then from and the then frozen food section downstairs. Yeah, she, yeah, she went downstairs to frozen foods. Yeah, and so okay, you went home then after that, and did you say to yourself, "Oh my God, I have to write this down"? Yeah. So right yeah. then that day. Yeah, I kn I knew that that something had happened to me that was. Um, was was unusual and uh, lent itself to a joke. Now um, I wrote the first couple of lines and I tried it out at a bar and um, it there was there was no sign that there was going to be any any laughter there. Um, but then I told the story to some friends and they 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 laughed and so I said so I should continue. I, I mean I actually had to ask them outright so I should continue trying to make this joke work. This is worth worth working on. They were like oh yes and. I, I feel like other comedians wouldn't have needed that that extra uh, feedback. Other comedians would have said, "Hey, I, I believe in this. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep working on it." So, I, but, but feedback's strong though. Feedback, yeah. you know, tells you where to. You know, Chris Rock does it right. He goes to the Laugh Factory in New Brunswick, sure, yeah. and he just reads stuff off a napkin yeah. just to see. He, it almost like he makes his jokes bad, and then if someone laughs, he knows he's got yeah. something to work on there. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's really helpful, and I and I and I think that's also a, a position I would love to love to be in. And I, and I'm I'm that way. In, in Boston, I can go into any of the clubs and and work on new stuff. But in in New York, there are very few places where I can just walk on and and go up. And um, I I always dreamed that that was the that was the place that you got to where you were just un, unstoppable at that point because I I, I feel like the the um, the only thing holding a, a comedian back is how often he gets to try out his his um, material and 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 if you take that variable away and it becomes unlimited you can you can really um, really make great great strides. But Gary, this is what I don't understand. You're on four to five hundred times <laughs> a year. How much more do you want to go on? Like you you already have it. You already got right. there. But I feel of like of course there, nobody ever feels they got there. But you right. uh, as objectively, I can yeah. say. You're there. Yeah, I just, I just when when you talk about Chris Rock growing in with a with a list, I can't just go in with a list and and have people pay attention. I have to bring the bring the goods at least for the most part, so that I can work in what I do is sort of work in um, the new things in between things that I that I'm fairly certain will will 
will work because I, I'm still largely um, unknown. I, I can I can walk around the city and 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 not get recognized all all day, whereas Chris Rock would be would be mobbed on on every corner. So there is, I'm not, I'm not saying I need Chris Rock's uh, fame to be satisfied, but the the fact that he can go in and, and try out his new things at any any club uh, any day of the week is is um, a, a great advantage that he has over somebody at my at my level. Do you think there is a level in any area? But let's talk comedy. Do you think there is an, a, a level where you hit that level and then finally you can say, okay, I'm happy. I'm I'm happy. I'm at this level. Um. Yeah, because I think I've I've gotten to it at, at certain points. Like a, like I, I felt when I was getting those development deals, I was like, all right, this is where I should be um, at at best in my in my careers is where these other comedians of my age and ability are getting development deals, and I'm with them getting the development deals, and and now now I feel like I'm in a, a, a big a bigger um, group of people who've sort of been through that and 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 not um, gone on to. Um, you know, traditional fame and, and fortune. But let's take a look at like um, someone like uh, Jim Gaffigan's career. Obviously, yeah. great stand up. Amazing. Great, great stand up for many years. He also yeah. wrote a couple books that were very funny, which is yeah. basically his stand up act. Right. But it's only in the past year or so he's got the Jim Gaffigan show. Right. You know, and he's, how old is he? He's like the same same age as us or maybe a little yeah. older. I don't know. Right. Yeah, probably and, the same age as me. Yeah. Yeah. So it happens over time. Yeah. You know, like it could happen next year. You don't know. Yeah. You just keep, keep yeah. going at it. It's it's possible. I just I just don't. Um, and he's on some weird channel too. It's not even like a traditional comedy right, channel. True. It's like Nickelodeon or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's it's true. And and he's someone I admire. I admire very much. But I I just feel like there there's so many so many hoops to jump through in between where I am and where where he is that I I just feel it's it's um it's overwhelming and 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 daunting and and um. I I um I hope I won't need it to to be um to be satisfied or feel like I've I've made it. Well, so so when did it's, it's 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 a it's a long shot. Why do you think it's a long shot though? And, and again, I say this, you know, you just had a special release. It's, I'm sure it's doing well. Uh, it's written about like it's great. Uh, you have you're on any talk show you ever want to go on to. It seems to me like you Google you and you're on every single talk show. Uh, what what does it take to go from here to there? Um, I guess there was a there was a time where I got a lot of more yeses, and I get a lot of I get a lot of noes now. Like I wanted to go on um, a few of the of the TV shows to promote the the special, and um, they were they were very polite and 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 said that you know uh, oh we love Gary. That's the that's the thing that you get sick of in this business. If you if you love him, then then the least you could do is put him on your show. So I'll I'll wind up going on. Um, Probably Conan to promote the, the the special, but it would have been nice if every single um, every single show was like, "Hey, will you promote your special on our on our show?" That would be that would be nice, and I and I feel like um, not not out of the realm of of of, um, of my talent. Well, I feel like I feel like with many areas now because of the internet. Like, let's say you write books. You can't just write a book anymore. You now have to go on, like, speaking yeah, tour. Right. And you have to um, write blog posts and articles for all the different websites. Do you feel like you need to do extra stuff outside of stand-up? Like, you focus so much on stand-up. Do you yeah. feel like now you need to do a book? Or, uh, I don't know. I don't know what else. Try out for roles on, yeah. I'm just making it up, like, roles on sitcoms or whatever. No, I think I think all those things are really, really helpful and, and part of the whole part of the whole package and I guess I'm I'm um, I'm uh, there's there's sour grapes in, in in that I think oh I just wanted to be a, a stand-up and they're making me do all these things that aren't stand-up they're not making me making me do anything all those things are are very fun but they're um, they're uh, they require auditioning and preparation and and or just um, you know in the, in the idea of a book just sitting down and, and and spending a lot of time with my with my thoughts which is very very difficult for me because I I, I have um, you know these ruminating negative th thoughts where I where I um, I don't they um, They really overwhelm me with with um, de depression many many times. So like what? Like what? Like what will be a thought today? Like or yesterday that just sort of brings you down and doesn't let you work or focus? Um, I have, you know, when I write write things down or write a joke, I'll I'll just um, 
I'll just think, well, this has been this has been done before. This is very similar to to what somebody else talks about, and and um, I don't know if the audience is going to like this, and if if they do, I really need to to uh, to step up my game because this um, because it's not as good as the stuff that was on the special, and 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 then I get into the well, and you didn't even think the special was so good, and 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 it's just uh, it's it's um, it's a very t difficult. Um, uh, spiral that I that I that I enter when I when I start um, and then I start you, judging myself. On the days you get out of it, how do you get yourself out of it? Um, or do you never get? Out, have you never gotten out of it? I don't. I don't know that I've ever gotten out of it uh, fully. I just um, you know it gets to be a point during the day where I where I just naturally start to feel a little bit a little bit better if, after being. You know, there's there's um, there's a rhythm to my depression, so that it's it's very bad in in the morning when I get up and and it's hard to function. And then as it gets uh, further away from from sleep, the depression um, lightens a, a, a little bit, so that I can do my shows at night and I can I can interact with with other people. And then and then um, and then it resets first thing in the in the morning. It's like a, a groundhog day, day which is almost the, the opposite of what it should be. Like you would think sleep would rejuvenate you. Yeah. And yeah. at night you sort of lose, you yeah. know, there's kind of what's called willpower depletion and, right. you know, you have all sorts of depletion in your mind until you yeah. sleep again. Yeah. So, uh, like, what does a doctor say? Like, why does it start for you in the morning? Um, it's, it's just the nature of this particular type of de depression I have, which is, which is treatment resistant so that I, I take a lot of, I take a lot of medication and, and, and go to a lot of talk therapy, but it's, um, it's uh, this this particular episode has lasted lasted well over a, a, a year now, and and has required just uh, pulling out all the stops as far as I've tried tried just about every every medication and, and treatment there is there is out there, and and um, I may may wind up trying um, something that that um, works for treatment resistant. Um, which is which are I think M A O I I think is a, is the name of it. They're sort of an older uh, class of, of antidepressants. We're turning turning this into a pharmacology report. Um, it's sort okay. Of, sort of an older uh, class of, of many people listening to this yeah. need need a pharmacology report. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that 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 particular class of antidepressant seems to be um, more helpful in treating anti-resistant um, depression. And and I think it was something that. Um, that uh, I, I first um, heard about when I when I first started being treated, but it requires a, a certain diet and to be off all the other antidepressants for five weeks. So it's it's a um, it's a challenge to really switch over to that to that uh, um, that class. This is totally like an aside, like completely tangential. But yeah. what I always wonder is there's all these antidepressants and anti-anxiety pills and you know the average it takes for any patient to find what works for them is eight years apparently so wow. because there's so many different types of yeah. chemicals in the brain yeah. and how you can manipulate them is it is it dopamine is it serotonin is it something else yeah um but why don't they and i know this is controversial now because of prince's death from percocet overuse supposedly right but why don't they prescribe more kind of controlled happy pills as opposed <laughs> to antidepressants no i know i i, I read... like percocets are actually make you happy right right I'm not recommending I, them but no it does happen that way yeah and you know in the in in the past several months i've i've smoked pot a few times and that that has made me um less anxious and 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 more happy um, in some cases, euphoric. So, um, I, I, I guess I self-medicate to a certain extent. But the but the the downside of the the Percocet is the is the addiction. I try to stay away from things that are that are um, ad addictive. But all the antidepressants are addictive. That's why you can't get off them for five weeks because it's a yeah, challenge. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I hadn't I hadn't really thought about that. It, and, What's not addictive? The pharmaceutical industry, like seventy five percent of drug deaths this year, are going to come from the actual approved pharmaceutical industry, wow. as opposed to like crack or heroin or wow. the traditional bad drugs that's incredible yeah it that's used to be 25 percent, like let's say 15 years ago wow but like people got more sophisticated about it and doctors got more willing you know some if you find yeah. the right doctor they'll prescribe yeah so yeah. but but do you think depression might be linked to comedy like you get let's say annoyed at something and so that and maybe even depressed about something so that becomes the seeds of like, well, why am I annoyed about this? Why am I depressed about this? What's funny in this? What's ludicrous in this that I was depressed about? Let's say this example: the woman in the Trader Joe's. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's a, there's a certain uh, 
side of that though that that is um, that cures depression in that this thing that I this exchange I had with the woman at, at Trader Joe's really uh, enraged me and depressed me um, but then there's this this vengeance you get from from actually making other people laugh about it and proving that oh she was she was wrong and all these people are on my side and they're laughing and, and applauding at the at the um, at the audacity this woman had to to leave her cart on my uh, Unwatched at the at the checkout stand while she continued to shop. So, so there's some there's some redemption there from from writing a, a joke about it. So, but, but even seeing the humor in it kind of comes from depression. Like most people would be like, oh, okay, whatever. And you're like, no, yes, yeah. I I have to get yeah. justice. You yeah. say that I I I'm about justice. Yeah, like you you kind of bring down the, this kind of lofty concept of justice to this line. Yeah, and that's both depressive and funny. Right. Yeah. I guess if I I didn't have a depressive view of the world, I, I wouldn't have the the uh, the premises to to go off. But at the same time, if I if I didn't have the depressive nature, I would I would have more um, more confidence and more energy to to um, write more more things and and maybe expand my my um, um, activities into into more acting or, or podcasting or, or something like that or writing a book. Yeah. Well. Okay. Let me give you an idea on writing a book. Okay. Because I feel this is what Jerry Seinfeld did. And I feel this is even what Jim Gaffigan did. Take your last two or three specials, print them up, <laughs> staple them together, and submit it to an agent as a book. Just that's the first draft, and see how the agent responds. Yeah, that's that's interesting. But I, but I, um, that's the thing that really irritated me about Seinfeld's book Sign Language. I was like, he he uh, pretty much did that. And, yes, and he I, totally did that. Yeah, and and I. I By the way, Jim Gaffigan did that too. I didn't. I didn't notice that. I, I haven't read. Um, uh, much of a, much of a Jim Gaffigan's books, but um, I read the sign language, and I was like, "Well, that doesn't that doesn't seem fair." I already saw this in on on TV or, or on on the Seinfeld show. Right, but you're a professional comedian. All the readers were from Des Moines, right. so nothing wrong with Des Moines. They no, like right. the, they bought the book, right. sold you know millions of copies of the book. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could try that, and I'm not above trying that. So um, for, perhaps I will, I will um, uh, collect that and send it along. That that's a, a technique that works in every field, by the way. <laughs> like I know people in every field who have done that. Wow. Like, you know, their articles, they'll just print them up. They'll their blog posts, their their stand up routine, um, just as a first draft. Not like you're, you're not even committing to doing it. You just yeah. want to see what the agent says or what right. the publisher says, yeah. and see what happens. Yeah. I did submit one time, um, uh, not a not a draft, but maybe an outline for for a book about my my all my thoughts on on um, school from kindergarten through through twelfth grade. I had had notes and and stories and jokes ab ab about that. So that was as close as I really got to to um, throwing my hat in the ring as a as an author. Did you ever perform them though? Those jokes? Um, some of them some of them uh, wound up in my in my act, but but. Um, the vast majority of them were just just memories. See, and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna push for the stapling technique because <laughs> you know those things actually because you've done them hundreds of times. You know yeah. those things actually make people laugh. Yeah. So a book of them, you won't have all the timing and everything. You know, Seinfeld's a master of timing as well. He didn't have all the timing in his book, but it's still yeah. funny on paper. Yeah, it certainly is. Yeah. So so what's next? What are you what are you working on now? Um, I'm working on my next uh, special, and I'm, I'm hoping to do a one-man show. Jason Alexander from Speaking of Seinfeld, Jason Alexander wants to wants to direct a one-man show idea I have about. Um, it's called Hebrew School Dropout, and and it just talks about my relationship with God over the years, and and my religion, and my my um, knowledge of of the Old Testament, and, and things like that. So, but, oh, but oh my God! And by the way, two things. One is you're. You, you know, a what you said before about your career, and oh, by the way, Jason Alexander wants to direct a one-man show based on my material. Okay, we'll leave that aside for a second. <laughs> but your bits about the Bible in you know in your last special and other places, like Fraser Crane is almost like the or, or Jesus is almost like the Fraser Crane of the Bible, you know, because yeah. it's, it's like this great sequel in the yeah, yeah, entertainment yeah. business. Oh yeah, like this stuff is really insightful and uh, you know and funny. Oh, thank you. You you totally should do something on religion, but uh, you know it's it's great stuff. Thank you. 
Um, so so okay, so he's gonna direct that that show. He's the most one of the most famous comedians yeah. in history. Right. He picked but, you but out. But first, to, I have to <laughs> I have to I have to write it, which is which is um, overwhelming. And so do you, do you like will you go home today and think about it, or are you sometimes it's hard to switch from like okay I have to come up with new material for a stand up tonight to okay now I got to do this longer term thing because you yeah. you're the type you need this inst you need that instant stimulation of tonight yeah. so a one man show with Jason Alexander almost seems too far away yeah yeah it's 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 hard but I but I'm you know I'm making uh, baby steps towards towards having something for him and I'll send back and forth some some writing and and things but it's it's still finding out what is what is it really about and what I what I want to say through it and how does um uh, this is a little tangential also but your kind of you know success that's that's still blooming as a stand-up comedian and and other things and mixed with this depression like I uh, you're obviously in relationships and stuff like how does the person you're with kind of deal with the back and forth um she's uh in incredibly supportive i mean i i you know i i, I ask her free frequently how she can how she can tolerate my 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 moods because um a lot of time i'm just not i'm just not there and um so so i've never been more convinced that somebody loves me just because what, what she's had to um in, endure over the over the past year but at the, at the same time i'm a, I, I sometimes think um, I'm doing her a disservice by by holding on to her. That that um, you can't think that way. No, I know, <laughs> I know. That's hard because because uh, maybe she also likes you know being a caretaker in some sense. Not that you need caretaking, right? But you know that could be something that actually is... yeah. But there is a, there is a caretaking aspect to it. Yeah. So okay, so Jason Alexander potential one man show, potential book. Uh, yeah. What else? Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll probably keep auditioning for for some TV and, and movie things, and and um, hopefully just uh, I'm gonna do another another Conan uh, appearance this this summer. So so that's what I'll be working on, and then just trying to get better as a as a stand up and write write newer stuff. And and how do you now get better as a stand up? Like where do you feel? And again, I'm always interested in kind of like peak performance at like this mastership level like how do you keep fine-tuning your skills to to become more of a master at what you do well i i was i was thinking recently that that maybe the one-man show was the next thing because a one-man show is almost like you're, you're taking a um a small part of your what you would do in an act in a comedy and really expanding it which is which is what I try to do with my jokes in general. But in, instead of doing 15 minutes on Trader Joe's, I would do an hour on. It wouldn't be on Trader Joe's. It'll be on the the Old Testament and my experience with with being a, a Jew in, in America at the time I I am. So um, that that's what that's maybe the next maybe the next step is to is to take the take the um, the um, microscope and and and. Um, ex expand the this the scope of it and 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 maybe maybe do more and and more of that um I like, I like how you say it's a microscope because it's like you it's like what you were saying earlier you kind of have the joke but then you hone in on each word and see where you could yeah. uh digress so like again and we keep talking about the trader joe's bits and nobody knows what we're talking about unless they watch the <laughs> ne right. netflix special but right in the beginning you say like Trader Joe's is like Narnia, and yeah. then you go into which particular Narnia, then you go into, by the way, a biblical bit yeah. about Narnia and you being a child, and then finally yeah. you're back. But then I was on the line, and yeah. it's coming all the way back, right. and uh, it's you don't really see that in a lot of comedians. I feel like, in, to some extent, some of your style is similar to Seinfeld's in that you'll play with language a lot. Yeah. Uh, you'll play, like, he'll you'll do that thing where you'll have many different words to describe something just he used to do that as well sure and that in itself is also funny kind of all the ways you know the hundred different ways you know Jewish people describe loser oh right, uh, right, right it was yeah. very funny how oh, you did that you. and uh, uh, but he'll do something where he's playing with words like that and I feel that's very Seinfeldian but you you take it to a new level because um, it's almost athletic the way you take it because you oh, say so you. many words oh that, thanks that's funny um, but uh, but yeah so look Gary, thanks so much for oh, thanks coming for having on me. My this show. was an honor. You're a great, I, great interview. I really, I really like listening to you, uh, even when I'm not not the subject. Yeah. Well, well, 
Uh, I like all of your stuff. I've watched. I've had. I've sent out links to your YouTube videos. And oh, your that's specials really generous so of you. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. who who are your comedians that you admire? So you've mentioned Louis C.K. But yeah, uh, Louis and Maria Bamford. And um, oh, I love her actually. Yeah, yeah, she's in, she's incredible. And um, I'm trying to think who else is is uh, incredible. Jim Gaffigan and and. Uh, the late Mitch Hedberg, I love, and and Stephen Wright, and and just uh, there's there's so many that I'm probably it's Doug Stanhope that I'm leaving out, um, but but they're they're just uh, uh, we're really in a golden age of of stand up comedy, and and um, Seinfeld and the late Gary Shandling, and just uh, it's really too many to and to it, mention. Is it too much to ask? Like, what what books would you recommend if someone was kind of interested in learning more about just this art? Um, I'm trying to think. There, uh, I think the books aren't really the, the how-to books aren't really written by the best yeah. comedians. I think you know Bill Maher wrote a book years ago called um, True Story, which was which was sort of a novel of his experience starting off as a as a comedian in in New York. And, and oh, I didn't know and that. that. Yeah, and that was really that was really good. I'm surprised they never made it into a movie because it was it really captured um, a lot of what it means to be a stand-up comic, which is which is that. Um, I, I heard a, a poet, and it might have been the, the poet laureate under under Clinton. It was. I think his last name was Collins, and he said that the hardest thing about being a poet was figuring out what to what to do with the other twenty three and a half hours of the of the day. And I feel I feel that that's a, a lot of with 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 comedy. You have a lot of free time, and figuring out what to what to do with it is is a is a big part of the a big part of the profession. You seem to like watch a, a lot of documentaries too. I mean, you refer yeah. many times to documentaries in yeah. in your specials, yeah. like the Helvetica one. Right, right. What, what's right. your favorite documentaries? Um, I love. Or what's your favorite documentaries about comedy? Oh, I, I love. Um, there was one called Comedian by Jerry Seinfeld yeah. that was re really inspiring, and then there, there's one called um, One Stand Up Stood Out um, that was really uh, about the Boston scene in the in the '80s and maybe part of the '70s. So who, who was the stand up stand up who stood out? Um, there were there were uh, there were a number of them, but it was like uh, Steve Sweeney and Don Gavin and Stephen Wright and Dennis Leary and and guys of that um, Tony V and guys of that that uh, level and and um, it was, that was a really good that was a really good um, documentary too. And then what about a documentary about any topic? Uh, Hoop Dreams. I really love. Oh, Hoop Dreams is the best. I, I really think that's one of the best documentaries of all time. I really loved it. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna watch that again. I think that was on like. I want to say HBO 1996, something Probably. like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, again, Gary, it's been such a pleasure oh, talking thank, to you. I'm thank so you. Excited. I had such a great time. Thanks yeah. for having me in. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And then Jay, can you take a picture from from there, like while we're sort of talking? For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey. I have a lot more to tell you about this podcast, and you can find all my show notes and links and resources on my website on jamesaltucher.com. Sometimes I write about what I learned. Sometimes I write about ideas I got from the interview. Sometimes I have some backstory to how I got the interview going. I think you'll really like it. You'll also find lists of all the books we mentioned, other influential thinkers that are related to this guest, and more. Just go to Uh 